Hey guys, so I was thinking about putting together a different style of video today. Um, I've been thinking about starting a segment called Bees and Teas. So I figured I'd sit down and kind of let you get to know me a little bit, talk about some bees, and just sit down and have an actual conversation with you. So I got myself a nice cup of tea here. Yes, I know this is backwards, and no, my steering wheel is not on the wrong side of the vehicle. Um... My camera likes to flip it so it looks like my steering wheel is on the in, on the wrong side as if I'm in like Europe or something. Um, so yeah, I know you probably can't read this because it's going to be backwards for you, but find joy in the journey. Perfectly fitting for my life right now. Um, my life is currently how you would typically expect somebody in their mid-20s to be. <laughs> Things are always constantly changing really fast. So don't mind the whole setup in my car. Um, this is kind of like the best spot for me to do it right now and don't mind the whole outfit and do and all that stuff. Um, worked at 12 today, worked out a little bit, took a bath, now I'm here talking to you. So yeah, so I did just want to say, cause I've seen a lot of people in the comments, um, kind of like making jokes that hey you're like an expert in the beekeeping realm and I just want to clarify that I am not an expert I am still learning so so much about bees and in all honesty I'm probably always going to be learning about bees that is the whole reason why I've fallen in love with beekeeping and why so many people have fallen in love with beekeeping because it's something that you are constantly learning in and I don't think you can ever truly be an expert as a beekeeper because you're not a bee <laughs> so um and the science with bees is constantly evolving there is still so much we don't know about bees i swear probably like every single month there's some new research article about bees or something that comes out that's like hey we were wrong and actually this is the way it is and just the whole entire landscape and beekeeping is constantly changing so i do just want to clarify i am not an expert please don't call me an expert please don't put me up there as an expert because again i am still learning i'm still trying things out failing succeeding Eating, all that stuff. One of the phrases that I really like to say is you and I have different shoes so that it fits perfectly with beekeeping because there is not one exact way to beekeep and that is also what is so cool about it. There are so many different ways to get to the same destination um, and that is the end goal is just to keep your bees alive and we all find different ways to do that, to get our bees through winter, to help our bees succeed through the summer and have a really good flow and all of that. There's so many different ways to beekeep and part of that might be because of the different breeds of bees, the different locations, the different weather patterns, all of that stuff all has an effect on our bees. So the way you beekeep is constantly going to be changing from person to person and beekeeper to beekeeper. So I do just want to say that too and if you ever do come across somebody that but pretty much says that they know the exact way and it's only their way or the highway pretty much, I would be really wary, honestly, because that's not really how it is in beekeeping. Like I mentioned earlier, bees are constantly, um, the information that we have about bees is constantly evolving. We're still learning so much about them. So I just want to clear that up just a little bit. But so... Since I've been learning so much about bees, my opinions and ideas have also been changing about bees. So this last summer, I was really gung-ho on saying, hey guys, I'm going to breed a bee that is 100% resistant to mites that requires absolutely no treatments at all. And I just want to call myself out on that a little bit because... After the last year of researching and working with bees and everything, I'm kind of realizing some things, um, and that is, I don't want to say that I'm going for treatment-free anymore. Um, I want to say instead that I'm going for being fully chemical-free, and the reason I say that is because to be treatment-free, I don't think is reasonable, so... What would really, this is going to be like super technical and is kind of like the whole, there's a whole debate around it about what actually is treatment free, but kind of the way that I'm looking at it as is 
even ways even ways you manage your bees are considered treating your bees even breeding for vsh genetics is a way of treating the genetic line so i don't really want to say that i'm trying to be treatment free i'd rather say that i'm trying to be chemical free because i really believe that there isn't really a way that we can actually beekeep the way we beekeep here in america um without any sort of intervention from the beekeeper to help reduce the mites. Now, I do believe there is a way to beekeep that does not require chemical treatments um, or even organic acids, even organic treatments. Um, that is the main thing that I'm trying to stay clear of just because of all of the research I've been reading on the way that it affects the hive and the bees themselves, um, like their gut microbiome and the whole microbiology of the hive itself, which is very important. Um, it has an effect on all of that, and a lot of those different treatments also have an effect on the, how the genes are displayed in the in our bees as well. So, um, in a way, it can kind of make them sick too, because again, these treatments they're technically treating a bug on a bug or a, an insect on an insect. Sorry, bees are technically insects. I know, but but yeah, sorry kind of got off on a tangent there. But so yeah, I kind of want to clarify it as being chemical free. Um, because I do believe that we will have to manage our bees in order to um, reduce our varroa levels in our colonies. We can't just like leave it and forget about it um, and then just cross our fingers and hope for the best. I don't really think that's reasonable with where we're at right now in the science and our bees. And in all honesty, even if we do, which we are, breeding a bee that is very, very mite resistant, I still don't think that we will see a day when we can't do pretty much absolutely, like we don't have to do anything to help reduce mites. Um, and the reason I say that is because bees, they naturally do, the way that we beekeep in America is not really um, beneficial to the ways that bees actually work. So the bees, they naturally want to be able to requeen in the summertime by means of swarming. Um, and the cool thing about this is, is it works perfectly with the way that mites are. So when they requeen, they end up getting a pretty much a brood break and that ends up reducing the mite count that is in that colony. And it does that because when all of, when it has that brood break and there's not a queen in their laying and they're waiting for this new queen to go on a mating flight, um, this gives time for all of the brood that is in those cells to then hatch out. And when all of those, all of that brood hatches out, then so are all the mites that are in those cells. They're also going to come out and go on to the bees. So in order for the mites to keep reproducing, they have to go in a cell. And I don't remember the exact time frame, but there's a certain time frame of how long they would like to be on a bee before they need to go in a cell and reproduce. Um... But anyway, so what's en what ends up happening is then when that queen finally comes back for a mating flight, she finally starts laying eggs. All of these mites are like, okay, we've been waiting to reproduce and breed and we need to do it ASAP. So that first bit of brood and larva pretty much gets sacrificed and all of those mites just storm those cells and there'll be multiple mites in every single cell. So many mites that there's not enough food in the cells to feed them all. Um, because say there'll be, there'll be like 12 mites in a cell when really there's not even supposed to be that many. Um, so there won't be enough of the, um, nutrients from that, that larva to go around for all those mites. So when that cell is then capped over, those mites are pretty much going to starve to death. So using a way of a brood break is really, really beneficial. And the bees do this naturally on their own. So... I think there's going to be multiple different ways that we have to intervene as beekeepers in order to help with the mites. Um, one of the things I've, I've noticed is green bottom boards. That is also technically a way of treating um, because the idea with that is if you put a um, like a... Um, an insert that goes underneath the screen and then you put Vaseline on that, then when the mites fall off the bees and they go through that screen, they then get stuck down there and they end up dying. Um, I have used this and I have noticed that my hive always had lower mite, mite counts than the other hives. Um, 
Now, this is something I should test more just to see how effective it is because it could have just been that those bees were doing well, that it was good genetics, um, and that they weren't going around areas that had lots of mites. So, definitely something I need to test out more. Um, but that is a really great way to help with mites. And then also even just how we requeen as beekeepers. Um, that can also be technically a way of treatment because, again, it goes to that broodless period and all the mites end up dying from that. Um, so I don't really feel like we can truly say that we can be treatment free. We're going to have to manage our bees to help them deal with Varroa. And there are definitely ways to do that without using chemicals. Um, the, the guy that I teamed up with, Casey, I don't want to call him a queen breeder anymore. We actually agreed on saying that we are queen improvers. We are trying to improve our queens the most possible and just create the best queen that we can possibly make. I don't really want to say I'm a queen breeder because I'm not artificially inseminating. I'm open breeding. Um, but also, like I like I said before, I'm not in this for the money. I just want to improve the queens. So the queen prover that I teamed up with, um, he has been fully chemical free on his breeding yard. Um, so it is possible. It's a hundred percent possible to do that. But it does require management, which he's done by requeening, brood breaks, and whatnot, splitting, all of that stuff. So. Anyways, this is kind of like a little bit of a ramble, um, but just some of my thoughts about the whole entire thing, um, about the whole entire debate on treatment free and um, like chemical free and whatnot. Um, because yeah, last year I know I was like super gung ho about, okay, I'm going to breed a bee that is 100% not going to need any intervention from the beekeeper. But in all honesty, I don't think that's something that's reasonable now knowing what I know. So yeah. <laughs> So this is also kind of something, I also kind of want to talk about VSH. So I like that we're making a B that is super mite resistant. And if you don't know what VSH is, it stands for Varroa, Varroa Sensitive Hygiene. And what it is, is it's this breed of bee, or technically it's a trait um, that we have found in bees that will make the bees be able to manage Varroa by taking, what they'll do is they'll, they'll be able to smell in the cells and know that there are Varroa in there and they will uncap the cells, pull the brood out, and also when that happens, the mites will then have to come out of the cells. So what they're doing is they're completely interrupting the um, reproduction cycle of the Varroa mite and that's how they're able to keep the, the mite numbers down. Now this is super, super beneficial because this is a way that the bees can manage Varroa on their own. Um, but I'm not entirely sure how I feel about VSH yet. I feel like in all honesty, and I'm probably going to get a lot of hate for this, but it's like this really huge fad right now where everyone just kind of broadcasts, I have VSH, I have VSH, get my VSH bees, get my VSH queens. But like, do we really know if those bees have VSH in it? Not everybody are doing, is doing, um, the tests that are required and also, Will that test truly show that the that B has a VSH trait? I don't know. Does VSH just kind of blanket all mite resistance in that form? Because I also have bees that I did notice this year. Um, we're uncapping cells and pulling out brood that had mites in it. So um, would that mean that my bees have the VSH trait too then? Or is that just something that the bees kind of have learned to do? Um, I don't know. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. I'm kind of just like throwing out all my thoughts out there. Um, like I said, I'm not an expert and I don't want to come across as an expert. I There's a lot of things I don't know and I'm always open to learn. So... Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't tried out VSHBs yet, so I don't know how effective they are yet. I would like to try some out this springtime just to see how they are. I do know that VSH itself is considered an additive trait, um, which is really good. Um, but it also does kind of worry me that 
when you maybe this is just thinking about this in a very simplistic way but when you pick up one trait are you then going to end up losing other valuable traits in a b that is the one thing that i'm really concerned about about us all going just streamlined towards vsh is what about the other traits in b's that we actually like and need like example bees that do not consume a ton of resources in the winter especially for us northern beekeepers as we all know it's really important to have bees that do not demolish all your food or even just bees that know how to how to go into winter well or bees that can make a ton of wax or bees that even have a sting that can kind of work as like um is it called uh apotherapy the kind of therapy where they sting you and it helps lower inflammation. Um, there's so many different traits in, in bees that we're just kind of forgetting about. And we're just kind of streamlining on VSH itself. When I think there's other traits that we also need to keep in the genetic pool. Because if we just streamline on VSH, we're going to end up losing all of those traits and not be able to get them back. So... I don't know. Again, these are just all my thoughts on the on the whole entire situation. And to kind of like circle back. So like I said, VSH is an additive trait, which is absolutely great. So I might be kind of contradicting myself here. But what it means when it's an additive trait is it's supposed to... I believe it's supposed to not be replacing other traits i'm not entirely sure so please i know some of you guys probably know the answer to this so please drop it in the comments let me know i would love to know um but one of the cool things about it is that it only has to what john harborough found he's the one that found bshbs um is that it only has to show up in 50 percent of the alleles in the genetics of that b in order to show VSH traits. Um, so alleles are the strands in your DNA or in their DNA. So it only has to show up in 50% of them, which is really good because that means if you were to get a VSH queen and then you were to breed her with your local genetics and then keep um, breeding that genetic line, you're going to be able to keep the VSH in your in your, um, your apiary um, if you do it correctly. So... I really like that because that also means that you can breed it with another bee and bring in those traits as well. So I don't know, kind of contradicting myself here. There's still a whole lot that is unknown about it. Um, and in my honest opinion, I kind of feel like there, there's a lot of vagueness in VSH itself. Um, that's all you hear about, but yeah, I don't know. I think there's other traits that we need to focus on as well, um, or really, I think there's other traits we need to think about and not just focus on one, um, because also, probably going to get a lot of hate for this, <laughs> but I don't really think Varroa is our biggest problem. I think bees have many other problems, and what we're just focusing on is Varroa itself. Um, Right now, it's pretty well known that bees are really struggling to find resources in the area with how we're just completely tearing down natural landscapes and turning it into pretty much concrete uh, concrete jungles and we're turning like huge like flower fields into huge cornfields instead um there's also even pesticides that kind of play a role in everything um i know i've heard uh there's a youtuber called the P uh, peaceful minds and uh, he's had a lot of issues with his bees and pesticides um so peaceful minds if you're watching this shout out to you i am heart wrenched seeing everything that you've been dealing with with your bees and pesticides it's insane what pesticides do and how they're allowed in our country but anyways so i i feel like there's other things that are really affecting our bees not just varroa varroa is a problem yes but i feel like it's not our biggest enemy so i don't know i just think I kind of feel like I'm saying the same thing, but I just think that we need to be breeding bees with multiple different traits, not just singling in on one trait. Because then also what happens if that one kind of bee then also isn't able to fight off something that we then have later down the ro later down the road. We need genetic diversity in our bees um, so that they can constantly be able to um, evolve and fight off anything that comes their way. Um, now... The other argument that I've seen a lot and a lot of beekeepers say is that it's not Varroa, it's actually the viruses that are killing our bees. 
Um, and one cool thing that I did hear um, Stephen from Stephen Biko talk about <clears throat> is he said that um, in his testing, he saw that bees with the VSH trait also are very resistant to all these different viruses, which is really cool. Um, but also something that is br like really new research that we learned this year is something called the transimmune or Im immune, wait, transimmune generation. What is it? Generational immune priming. Yeah. <laughs> Generational immune priming. So it is a system in the bees. Um, and what it is, so have you ever gone into your hive and noticed that some of the brood in your colony looks like they had, like literally their head has been bitten off of? Um, what they found is this is actually because though that brood, most likely in, in all the studies they did, it, all of them pretty much had a very high number of deformed wing virus in bees that had their head um, bitten off of like that or brood that had their head bitten off of like that. So what the bees were doing is they're ingesting um, this deformed wing virus into their body and what they're able to do through um, transgenerational immune priming um, is they're able to then pretty much form like a vaccine um, and they do this through the vitelligen and transport. Now you've heard me talk about vitelligen in one of my past videos. It is super important to our bees and it is such cool new information that we've learned. Um, but they're able to then form a vaccine that they then put into their brood food. So as they um, secrete the brood, fruit, brood food through their glands and feed it to the brood, they're pretty much giving the brood a vaccine to that virus, which is really, really cool because that means that our bees can fight off viruses um, if they're just exposed to it. I actually have a hive that this last fall, I noticed there was a lot of deformed wing virus in it. I actually made a video about it saying, hey guys, should I euthanize this colony? Well, I did not euthanize it and thank God I didn't because that hive is still kicking right now, which is crazy to me. Um, because when they had deformed wing virus, that ended up sacrificing part of the brood. So every single when the when the when the queen lays eggs, she lays eggs of different. She lay. Oh, hold on, <laughs> I feel like I'm kind of like all over the place trying to figure out how to explain this to you. So the the queen is laying day, laying eggs say every single day so she lays eggs um on the first day like maybe like 100 eggs on the first day 100 eggs on the second day 100 eggs on the third day so she's laying eggs of different ages pretty much um so that when they all hatch they all hatch at different times and this is super super important especially when it comes to winter bees because that means that there's going to be bees for every single stage, every single hierarchy that is needed in the hive. Um, all the bees play different roles based off of how old they are. When they're the youngest, they're going to be a nurse bee to help feed all of the young. Then they move up to, um, I believe they then clean, it might be, I think they clean up the hive first, then they're a nurse bee. Then they turn into, I think, like a storage bee, the one that like uh, stores like all the honey and pollen. Um, then they turn into a field bee and then they pretty much die eventually or, or a guard bee as well. Um, I might be a little off on the order of it, but those are some of the jobs that they do have. So yeah, don't quote me on that, but um, on the order specifically, but those are some of the jobs that they have and it is all determined by how old the bee is. So it's super important to have bees of every single um, age in the colony for the winter time so that all of the all the jobs that are needed are actually completed. So um, one of the things about having D4 wing virus in your colony, especially in fall, is if it affects one um, part of the brood, say on like day three and four, now that colony is not, or even just like week two or three, now that colony is not going to have that life stage where they need it. So right when um, that first generation of bees then start to get old and die, there's going to be this huge gap and they're not going to have any bees to fill those roles. Um, now they can move bees up and make them fill roles earlier than they're supposed to, but 
still it puts a lot of stress on the hive and this is usually when a lot of hives collapse because they don't have those bees to perform the tasks and the in the jobs that are needed to be done so the fact that this hive is surviving after having deformed wing virus is absolutely blowing my mind um, I am 100% going to isolate this hive somewhere away from all of the beehives this year um, because I'm going to watch it and see if it gets D4 wing virus again um, because I'd really like to see if they've now formed a um, resistance or, or an immunity to D4 wing virus through using the tran transgenerational immune priming that I talked about. Um, so I'm really interested to see how that goes because if they did form an immunity, that will be really good. I'll be able to breed the bees with them, um, and hopefully that will also transfer. Um, because part of this as well is when those bees do ingest the um, the the bee the uh, brood that was infected with that deformed wing virus, um, they do at some point feed it to the queen so that the queen um, she has a way of being able to transport that form of vaccine also into the eggs so that the eggs are even exposed to the virus and can form an immunity before they fully uh, mature. So yeah, bees are so freaking cool, aren't they? Like, oh my gosh, amazing. <laughs> but okay, where was I even going with all of this? <laughs> I'm kind of just like spewing out all this information at you guys that I know. Um, so... Oh, okay. I was talking about how um, a lot of beekeepers say that the bees actually are fighting off, they're, they're dying from the viruses and not the mites. Um, okay, so now I want to add another layer to all of this. So another new bit of research that we found out is we first thought that Varroa just fed on the hemolymph or the um, bee blood in the bees. <clears throat> And what we found out is they're actually feeding on the fat bodies. And those fat bodies are this vitelligenin that I keep talking about. <clears throat> and vitelligenin is what is responsible for the transgenerational immune priming that I keep talking about. Um, so it's pretty much directly responsible for their immune system. And on top of that, vitelligenin is responsible for being their energy reserves to get through the winter time. Um, so it's also it has a um, a protein storage in the vitelligenin, and this is what they're able to then feed to the brood when it starts hitting um, close to spring, and they're needing to start building up the colony. Um, so the bees really rely on vitelligenin for pretty much everything in order to survive. So if their their vitelligenin stores start to become low, that colony is really going to struggle. So knowing this information, that kind of shows that it's actually, it, they, they both go hand in hand. It's both the mites and the viruses. Um, cause what's happening is the mite latches onto the bee, gives the bee a virus, but also pretty much sucks out, it sucks out that vitelligen. And so it sucks out their immune system. It sucks out their energy reserves. It sucks out pretty much everything that can help that bee fight off that virus and weakens them a lot. So then they end up dying of the virus. Um, but anyways, okay. So I kind of feel like I'm jumping around all over the place and like rambling about random things and just kind of spitting out information with you guys. Um, I've never really done like a podcast kind of thing and that's kind of what this is turning into. So I definitely will need to practice this more. Um, so sorry if I'm jumping all over the place, but hey, you're learning something. <laughs> So I do also want to talk about, okay, so I was at a bee meeting yesterday. I go to the River Raisin Bee Club in Adrian, Michigan, and one of the members, she was telling me about how her hive right now here in Michigan, right now it's um, the middle of March, and she has drones in her colony. So I need your guys' help. I need to help us figure out what is going on in her hive. So there's snow on the ground right now. It is way too early to have drones in a colony in Michigan. Um, she was kind of worried that maybe they could have had a laying worker, but she's also seeing other small newbies in her hive. Um, so she's thinking that there's a queen that is yes laying and brooding up. 
Um, she hasn't been able to look at any of the frames and find the queen or see if there's eggs and whatnot because it has been really cold, so she can't really take out any of the frames to look. Um, but one thing that she did mention, and I think this may be the reason why she's seeing drones in her colony, is she did mention to me that she had put out pollen feeders around a month ago and that she's been feeding them pollen. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but to my understanding, is pollen what triggers the bees to start making um start making drone bees and start brooding up in the springtime i'm pretty sure it is but please let me know if that's exactly what's happening um my idea was that maybe because of the pollen that is causing the bees to then think that spring is here and start rooting up and start producing drone bees so that might be what's going on with her colony right now um, so I don't know. What do you guys think? Um, she, no one really had an answer for her. So I would like to help her and, uh, solve this problem so that maybe she can figure out how to go about helping her bees and, and fixing them problems. So help her out. <laughs> what do you guys think about what's going on in her colony right now? Um, I have never personally fed my bees with pollen yet. I have been thinking about experimenting with this year. I probably won't do pollen patties just because of all of the issues that I've heard that they have with small hive beetle. They really attract small hive beetle because they're very soft um, and moist. And nine times out of ten, what I've heard everybody say is when you put a pollen patty in your hive, come back a week later, lift that pollen patty up, and it's going to be completely coated in a small hive beetle larva. Something you definitely don't want, especially in a colony that's coming out of winter that might be a small cluster. Not a good thing. So I'm probably going to try experimenting with um, just like putting up pollen feeders. So something that Ryan Flannery at um, the Bee Club had mentioned is that he has this method of he will take um, like the Parmesan cheese containers and he will poke a hole in it and he will... Um, put a rope through it and hang it from a tree and put pollen in it so that the bees can then go to it and find the pollen that way and bring it back because the bees like to work they nine times out of ten are going to pick something that they have to go work to go get versus something that you put right there in their hive right there pretty much on the front porch um, because bees are workers, so they love to work. So I thought this was an absolutely great idea. So I'm probably going to end up trying that. Just hanging some um, pretty much like pollen feeders from some trees. Um, maybe about like, I think he said 40 to 50 yards away from the hives. Um, so Ryan, if you're watching this, thanks for that tip. That was a wonderful tip. Um, and if anybody else tries it out, there you go. Um, so yeah, I was thinking about feeding them pollen so that it helps them brood up a little bit earlier. Um, you have to time it well with when the nectar flow is. So like I said, this will be my first year using it, so I don't know the exact time of when you're supposed to do it. But I was pretty much going to put it out probably sometime like mid to late April. Because usually our first nectar flow doesn't come until May. Um, and that's just kind of dependent upon the weather. Whenever you see the dandelions bloom, bloom, that is when our nectar is first flowing. That is the first big nectar flow. And that is a pretty big nectar flow for the bees is those dandelions. Um, so be watching out for that. But that's when I'm planning to do it. I'll definitely have a video out about it. Um, so yeah. But okay, I'll try to keep this a little bit short and not too long. But let me know if you guys like this style of video. Um, just kind of talking about my thoughts about bees, thoughts about anything else in life. Um, and if you guys have any questions, I will definitely answer them during this time. Um, I am super excited for the upcoming season. So that's kind of why I'm sitting here talking to you about bees. Because I need somebody to talk to you about bees. I miss my bees so freaking much. And there's still snow on the ground right now. Um, so can't really dig into them. It's pretty cold. And yeah, so if you like this style of video, let me know. Um, I will keep doing them. This will be called Bees and Teas, that style of segment, um, with my little Find Joy in the Journey cup. Um, I picked this cup out particularly because this saying resonates with me so much. So when I used to be a runner, um, I was pursuing professional running and trying to make an Olympic team. 
And one of the things I learned in that entire journey is that I never really sat back to actually enjoy the process. I just always was like, I need to make it. I need to make an Olympic team. I need the end goal now that I never really actually enjoyed the process of trying to get there. Um, and like I was always just kind of like gripping onto it and almost gripping onto it so tight that it was slipping through my fingers. So something that I'm kind of working on just for me myself is to be patient and find joy in the process because in all honesty, it's the process that's the best part. The top of the mountain is great, but it's the journey to get to the top of the mountain because it's the journey to get to the top for when you are truly growing and truly becoming who you're supposed to be. Um, and that's what's supposed to be exciting. And that's where you make all of your memories. And that's what that's when you uh, make the memories that you look back at and laugh at and say, oh my gosh, wow, I was so naive or just wow, like why would I even think that? That's so funny. Like that's how you know you're growing. <laughs> but yeah, so I thought this saying was absolutely perfect, but again, I'm rambling, so I will get going now and go eat some dinner before I head to bed. Um, I've been waking up at 2 in the morning right now to work to a 12-hour shift. Um, it's been going all right. I mean, it can. it's going how a 12-hour shift in a factory can go. If you've done that before, then I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about, but like I keep saying, I'm doing it for a purpose. I'm doing it for the bees. I'm, and I'm doing it to uh, be able to set my life up. And you know, you know how it is in your 20s. But anyways, okay. <laughs> I will see you guys soon. Let me know if you like this style of video. And yeah, bye.